thank you again, uh, Cruz and Natalie, for joining our series, uh, and welcome to, to SU. Uh, thanks a lot. Um, let me go through this uh, protocol of sharing, because sharing is caring, especially when you have a lecture. <laughs> um, the, so thanks a lot for the introduction. Uh, I think it's a really nice uh, way to start. Um, and before we introduce ourselves in the presentation, we wanted to start with two recent news that came up. Uh, online, uh, just to, to set the tone for the for the discussion today. Um, the first one, I don't know if you've been following this uh, ridiculous job description of the New Fields Museum of Art that they were calling, you know, basically to maintain their sort of white supremacy agenda of the institution where you're like uh, trying to hire somebody that will maintain the traditional white core. So I was sharing this as it was happening because my, my friend uh, Justin Garrett Moore has shared with me and then I had to also say that I got sort of gaslighting online where people saying that I was sharing fake news, that it was not possible that this institution was actually doing this. And it's just to show you the level of ridiculousness, uh, right? So when the New York Times published this, I, I thought that they should have changed the title, right? It's not insensitive to be a white supremacist. So I think that that would be the first thing I would like to say, uh, that we need to start addressing things in a more straightforward way we, and calling things by their name, right? So when we see things like this, we're not wondering if it's really about the economy, if it's about the law, the, the jobs we lost and all this romantic nonsense that academics love to engage in, but rather actually, you know, grab the ridiculous bull by the horns, you know, he's there, has horns. So it's, it shouldn't be too difficult to grab him by that, right? Uh, uh, you know, understanding also the, the, how the media plays a role in this and, and this like a kind of nauseating exchange between France and US where France, a lot of right-wing intellectuals, they're blaming like uh, post-colonial thought and, crit and, and critical theory to, to be an import from the United States to which the United States replies saying like, oh, you should accept our ideas, completely ignoring the whole world that has been engaging with the colonial practices for 500 years, you know, like the, the arrogance and petulance uh, between the, the, the empire is really disgusting, right? And we, that's something that we need to think about critically when we are thinking about architecture. So how does it come into this, right? Uh, what, what is a post-colonial, what is, what is the post-colonial for us and what are loud readers? Uh, so, so that's pretty much the framework of the, of the presentation today. Part one, clinical narratives, 1968, 2008. The fully developed ability to say no is also the only valid background for yes. And only through both does real freedom begin to take form. And, and how do we understand the image that we're consuming, right? Understanding the relationship between Black Lives Matter, between the, the climate crisis, uh, uh, understanding uh, how for us, you know, the post-colonial in a way reflects the idea that what used to happen in the colonies before, those regimes of brutality and, and and a lack of care for life has become accepted everywhere right now, right? It, it is not a coincidence that there are mass graves in the Amazon, but also in New York City, right? Uh, uh, and it's not a coincidence that these sort of uh, right-wing leaders of the, of the so-called free world uh, are nothing new, right? So uh, when we were in, in, uh, in Europe at the beginning of our practice in 2008, it was pretty easy to find propaganda films by Herr Bilders in the Netherlands, right? With, when he published Fitna, precisely in 2008 or 2009, the, the same year we were there. That is a, basically an anti-Muslim film. Uh, understanding what is the direct relationship between architecture and that, right? What, what, what does it mean that somebody that publishes a neoliberal manifesto like Yes Is More has no problem working with, with Jair Bolsonaro, right? That is uh, known for, you know, there's some of the, most, some of the disgusting quotes he uses uh, against indigenous people in, in, in the Amazon about sort of reclaiming the land and, and uh, th these ideas of really uh, uh, unashamed colonialism, uh, right? Understanding what is the relationship of this to, to, the, to everything we're going through from Black Lives Matter to climate decay to the, to the global pandemic, uh, right? Uh, when, we, when we work with people that attack the indigenous communities that are pretty much custodians of 85% of the natural resources around the world. What does it matter that the same people that, uh, what does it mean when the same people that brought us chattel slavery and uh, global colonization 
uh, offer to make to redesign Earth through a master planet. You know, there's so much wrong with this. Uh, but also, what is wrong is that the the platforms of architecture are the ones sharing this uncritically, right? Like it, it is to a point where we don't even know where to look if we want to find an, a, a critical voice or opinion, right? Where where figures like uh, Elon Musk will joke about cooping Bolivia to to get uh, um, uh, lithium there, right? When he said like we will coop whoever we want, deal with it. Um, and to give you a bit of background, and, and and perhaps for the younger people in the audience, there's something that maybe you can identify with us. We finished school in 2008. It was not a great year, right, to, to finish school during a financial crisis. And this is the, the map of our first 12 years of career, right? Uh, it is not voluntary. Me personally, I hate traveling, right? So I love all these like uh, Zoom lecturing, being everywhere and nowhere at the same time. Uh, so imagine being forced to move from your home country and travel all around the world. Uh, we were based in Beijing for seven years, which is a really fundamental part of our critical understanding of the world, living in a place during modernity, right? Like while modernity happened in, uh, in Europe and in the US perhaps uh, more than 100 years ago, we lived through modernity in Beijing. So we went from living in a city of 20 million people, this uh, Guijie, uh, in, a, in the street where we live, uh, in Dongtrimen, in the, in the second ring road in Beijing. We went from being here one evening having the, our last dinner in the city before moving to the US to teach temporarily, we thought, for a semester, uh, we woke up here. Not only in the heartland of Wisconsin, in the rolling hills where the glaciers didn't roll through, so it's still ro uh, uh, sort of hilly and, and, and remote, a remote location in the middle of the United States, but also in the heartland of the, of the idea of the white supremacist architect, in a way, that, that notion of the single white male genius that is gonna save the world, right? Like this is the home of uh, Frank Lloyd Wright. So our first home in the United, the continental United States was in the, the former home of Frank Lloyd Wright, the former studio in Taliesin. So what does it mean that we had to engage with this history, right? Of, of the, again, that idea of the singular male uh, white genius working with other uh, young men around him, right? Um, that are gonna save the world through architecture and how, trying to engage with different forms of pedagogy, right? So for us, it was not only dealing with sort of these urgent questions that for us were uh, we trying to address through our work, but also trying to, to compete with that history that is sort of uh, over our shoulders, right? How can we extend these uh, forms of knowledge through other pedagogical strategies, right? These are some of the thesis work of our former students uh, that were trying to ne not necessarily copy the aesthetics and the philosophy of organic architecture and so on, you know, the trademarks of, of, the, of Taliesin, right? But actually question critically the place where they were in and, and what were the, the, the things that they were engaging with, right? This part of a documentary we're in in the, in the BBC that we find really problematic, right? Like the title of Frank Lloyd Wright, the man who built America. There's so much wrong in this, starting with that America is not really a country, right? As we all know. Uh, and the fact that you can even think that a man can build America, right? In this case, being Frank Lloyd Wright, that perhaps didn't really build anything, but rather got people working for him for free to build it for him. So that's also another part of the story that is really interesting, right? The fact that even these institutions are, cha are challenged by neoliberalism as the school was forced to relocate to, to Arcosanti. And understanding, you know, when we were finishing school in 2008, it was the 40th year anniversary of 1968, right? 1968, the year of the Paris revolts, the year of a, of a of the civil rights uh, movement, uh, the year of, uh, of Stonewall in New York for the gay, gay rights and, and sort of queer activists taking over. Uh, uh, understanding how parallel is this to today is fundamental, right? Uh, seeing pictures of, of Paris in 68 and Paris in 2020, right? During the Gilles Noir protests in Pantheon of uh, Sub-Saharan African workers asking for better rights and, uh, and access to a dignified life. Understanding the parallels between the streets on fire then and the streets on fire now, right? Understanding that uh, mili militaristic apparatus is really present in our public spaces, right? Which are not really public. Uh, understanding, you know, when we see these pictures from Baltimore in 68 and Baltimore last year, nothing has much changed when you look at this, right? And it's quite scary, but also it's quite revelating understanding who is at the core of this, who is our, who are our comrades in this 
sort of struggles for human solidarity and who is tending against us, right? Understanding who are the icons in the center of this, you know, people like Angela Davis, understanding how privileged and lucky I am right now to be speaking to you through this screen and not behind a bulletproof screen as the most, uh, a lot of the black activists have to do in the 60s, right? Uh, with the many murders of them, right? Understanding what is the punishment that got through them when they used their power to exercise their right to ask for, for more di dignified life, right? Understanding what is the relationship to the land, in this case, indigenous people taking over Alcatraz in 69 uh, and, and the relationship of all these uh, regimes of anti-black oppression all around the world. Uh, from apartheid in South Africa uh, to all the lives that were taken, right? Uh, what is striking about this picture is not that all of them were killed uh, somehow in relationship to the power of the US government, but that uh, two of them, Malcolm X and Martin Luther King were two years older than me. Patrice Lumumba was only 31 years old and Fred Hampton was only 21, right? These people didn't even reach their 40s. So that, that's the, the level of, uh, of uh, sort of uh, resistance uh, some calls for, for uh, black dignity uh, percent, right? Uh, uh, understanding what is the role of these figures in our discourses? Are they present? And if, and if not, why are they missing from these discourses, right? Understanding how the history of art and architecture and culture, you know, uh, uh, between commas, uh, uh, how is it narrated? You know, this, this diagram from uh, Alfred Barr of Cubism and Art that was retaken by, by uh, Hank Willis Thomas by inserting all the coloni colonial uh, enterprises happening around the, the avant-garde movements. It's really important for us to understand what critical positionings can we take today, right? So we can understand that the extraction that is still happening in Congo, right? And that has been really central to fueling a lot of the, the design and architectural discourses that we have today is not very different to the extraction, extraction of rare earth minerals in China, or even understanding the legacy of this to, to the place where I come from in Puerto Rico. And, and I'm sure a lot of you know this painting by Turner that it looks like an abstract painting and so on. But when you look closely, you see the, the bodies of the black slaves that were thrown overboard to claim the, the insurance, right? Uh, what is crazy about this painting is not only the content of the painting itself, right? But the narrative around it. The fact that a, a, an American couple, a US American couple used to own the painting and sold it to a Boston museum and with the money that they acquire from the painting denouncing this sort of cruel act of colonization and anti-black slavery, they use the money to buy a sugar plantation in Puerto Rico, right? So the Hacienda uh, Central Aguirre was bought with the money that was uh, acquire, uh, acquiring this transaction from the painting of Turner denouncing the same thing, right? So how the discourses of liberation or at least critique of, this, of these situations are even subverted through the economies that are fueling them. It's really important for us in order to be able to make a critical argument about our current situation. Uh, Achil Bembe argues in his provisional notes on the post-colony that the post-colony is made up of a series of corporate institutions and a machinery of, of violence, uh, political improvisation, and a tendency to excess, right? And that's the post-colony in the case, you know, describing on, on Africa. But for us, in a different way, the post-colony with the, with the hyphenated version means not only what happens after the colony, but rather what happens when the regimes of brutality, cruelty, and complete oppression and extraction are exported from the colony and become the norm everywhere else, right? So what happens when, what happened in Puerto Rico some years ago with Hurricane Maria, right? Puerto Rico is the oldest colony in the world, it has been a colony since 1493, first from Spain, now from the, from the US. What happens when that, what happened there, the many thousands of people that die that the authorities didn't even acknowledge. And when Donald Trump came to Puerto Rico was throwing towel, uh, towel papers. What happens when that becomes the norm in the metropolis, right? In the empire, right? As we see in the US when a hundred, and this is pretty old already, a hundred thousand people died, right? So, so this regime of necropolitics where, where the authorities regulate who gets to live and who gets to die, it's not only something that is happening in the colonies, right? But it becomes really the norm all around the world these days, right? So it's not really difficult to find the similarities between the, the this installation of the shoes in front of the Capitol building in Puerto Rico with all the people representing the people that died and were not even recognized by the authorities. It's not very different to the mass graves all around the world today. Understanding for us who is at the center of these sort of imaginaries, 
we love this poem, necropolitical poem by Puerto Rican poet Raquel Salas Rivera that says, hey gringo, if you love death so much, why don't you marry it, right? This really at the center of that imaginary. What can we do against this necropolitics? What can we do with new manifestos? Like this uh, t-shirt by the spokesperson of the feminist collective in construction, that is uh, some of the leaders of the revolutions in Puerto Rico right now. Uh, and the t-shirt reads, anti-patriarchal, feminist, lesbian, trans, Caribbean, Latin America, right? Who is at the center of our imaginaries of struggle, right? What are the flags that are being waved that we should be solidarity with? Who is fighting this? What are the relationships between all these struggles around the world, right? From Chile to Puerto Rico to, to, uh, to the streets of Baltimore, Minneapolis, right? Understanding where do we lie in this as architects when oftentimes we are questioning if black life is more valuable than architecture, right? More valuable than a building. And that's often a discussion, right? When we are more upset because somebody broke the glass of an insured bank than when a, a black life is lost in, in plain sight, right? Uh, understanding, again, you know, the double think and the new speak that architects employ to sort of participate in these regimes of white supremacy and oppression, right? As, as we think about the, the, the completely corrupted, privatized uh, um, prison system in the US, and architects have the audacity to write that they design the tension and correctional centers that facilitate the humane treatment and rehabilitation of inmates while ensuring the safety and satisfaction of each staff member. I mean, in a country that incarcerates black and brown people at an exponential rate, you know, the, the biggest in the world, right? Uh, to, to write this is kind of not only insulting, but pretty demoralizing, right? Uh, understanding what, are the, what is the role of architecture in all of this, right? Uh, so it's not like we are peacefully watching from our sofa, but are, we are actually at the center of these regimes of apartheid and oppression, of environmental destruction, and the oppression against the peoples that have been really fighting for our collective future, right? Uh, understanding also what are the truly democratic forms of architecture. When people come together to collectively bring down monuments that were erected without any consent of the people oppressed by them, right? And, and again, I always say that this is my favorite form of architecture these days. Part two, Loud Readers, 1920-2020. The only purpose of education is to make new worlds collectively. This requires the practice of curiosity as a daily habit and the exercise of dignified and purposeful rebelliousness. Other worlds are possible. And we usually ask, do you see the difference between this picture and that picture, right, left and right? Somebody will say, there's no, men, there's no women in the left one, but right. That's the legacy of the Bauhaus, right? The legacy of our modern pedagogy of design uh, comes from a place that thought that women couldn't think in three dimensions, right? Where they had to invent disciplines so women could do them, like interior, textiles, uh, fabrics, photography, and so on, right? Uh, understanding why we don't learn instead about the people's art school in Bitebs, in a small Jewish town in what is now known as Belarus, where women were not only at the center here in the collectives of, of solidarity and, and collective production, but actually were even administering the school, where Bernard Molayeva invited Kasimir Malievich to come from Moscow and they started their collective Unobis, right? Or champions of new art. Why, why do we learn about one and not about the other? If there were, this one was one year before the Bauhaus, right? Or even for us uh, wondering about this, why we don't learn about the practice of education in the tobacco factories in Puerto Rico, where workers would choose one of their own that knew how to read, to read for them during the, the entire workday. These work, workers that were denied any other means of formal education, and some of them were former slaves or either uh, sons and daughters of, of, of former slaves, uh, um, will, will initially read uh, Victor Hugo and Flaubert and Dostoevsky, and eventually will start reading more politically engaged literature, like Marx, Bakunin, Engels, and Kropotkin, and they will, among these, there was a Luisa Capetillo who was arrested several times for wearing pants in public. Uh, she will also read her, her uh, feminist and uh, anarcho-syndicalist utopias in which workers will rob banks and live happily ever after in the countryside, eating delicious uh, vegetarian meals. Uh, and we, uh, once they started gathering and making strikes. The practice got banned by the government and by the corporations. And we decided to rescue this practice of solidarity 
by bringing other forms of philosophy to the center. As you can see here, people like Achir Bembe, Silvia Rivera Cusicanqui, Sayak Valencia, Franz Fanon, and, and start developing a series of presentations that were questioning the legacy of our education. One of these projects uh, was the Manual of Anti-Racist Architecture Education that you can download in Spanish and English from our website for free and, and try to question this legacy of a modernist pedagogy, right? Where we start asking what happens when we use the, the, the map that uh, Stefan Truby, the diagram that Stefan Truby uses to catalog obvious right-wing architects like Patrick Schumacher that wasted his time going around the world lecturing in defense of capitalism, like capitalism needs any lawyer uh, and trying to address this legacy of the, of the again, you know, the, the singular male genius that is gonna save us, therefore can be a monster and we will never denounce him. Uh, uh, and understanding the, the, the role of the institutional platforms in constructing these legacies without questioning them uh, and understanding what, ha what is happening today, right? When uh, Justin Garrett Moore gets erased by Architect Magazine from a presentation on urbanism, right? Where the only black speaker, somebody goes to the trouble of erasing him from the presentation, right? Well, uh, trying to understand what is the legal apparatus that is trying to enforce this sort of right wing uh, uh, agendas on our environment, right? Where uh, the executive order of the beautiful, right? Uh, uh, civic architecture in the United States or even projects that don't seem so evil at first glance, but then we understand the instrumentalization and invisibilization of black, of black people, right? On one hand, where a white designer is allowed to bring black youth with toy weapons in a space where if it's not for the applause of other white people, these children will get shot by the police, right? Or the many monuments done around the country where the word black is always erased to talk about slavery and non-black designers are always leading these projects, right? So, so uh, understanding how can we engage with this, with this, what happens when the right-wing spaces are not only uh, the people designing prisons, and designing detention centers and uh, you know people working for totalitarian regimes, uh, but architecture school itself, right? Where many of these people were trained, right? Where many of us were not even allowed to enroll until the 70s, the 80s, uh, where in many places where still there hasn't been even a single black professor or indigenous professor in the history of, of these institutions, right? Understanding the, what is the romanticization we're trying to build around this really whitewash history of, of the built environment, right? Understanding, you know, even colleagues like our, uh, like ours, uh, uh, Marcus uh, Breischmidt here in Virginia Tech that published Non-Referential Architecture, right? A quite popular book that, that denounces, you know, the, 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 the role of dystopia and being woke and critical theory and utopia saying that the, the architecture is really, uh, powerful when it's designed by this idea of the singular genius that gonna, is going to transform the world to form, right? Understanding what happens when we translate these diagrams of the Bauhaus to what they, what they really were. You know, when you translate the role of what the men and the women could do, men is at the center and at the top and women are just kind of leaf to the bottom disciplines, right? And we propose in our manual, instead of this closed system of, of a pedagogical diagram to, to create a spiral that is always under construction where anti-racism, anti-ableism, transfeminism, anti-capitalism, anti-imperialism and anti-colonialism and ecological justice are at the center. So every form of knowledge has to be intersected through the spiral, right? And we, we rework all these diagrams that are part of the architectural imagination, right? Uh, into showing how they are all, all the architectural systems and styles and, and programs have always been related somehow to, to uh, completely legal, legalized uh, uh, systems of anti-black oppression all around the world, as you can see here. Uh, on the, uh, it, this allows us also to understand the role of some institutions, right? Like the case that Philip Johnson was attending a Hitler Jung's rally the same year that he inaugurated the design and architecture department in the Museum of Modern Art in New York, right? So all these tools allow us to question architectural education, not only before, during, and after uh, a formal architectural education. Decolonizing the university starts with the deprivatization and rehabilitation of a public space. The rearrangement of spatial relations, relation, sorry, Fanon spoke so eloquently about in the first chapter of Les Danes de la Terre, it starts with a redefinition of what is public, what pertains to the realm of a common, and as such, does not belong to anyone in particular, because it must be equally shared between equals. 
So as part of this idea, um, we've been working in a series of, uh, of projects of, since several years, actually since before moving to the US and, and particularly uh, after being based in the, in the US where we've been working with the legacy of colonization through representation. And we've been looking at all these people that were inspired by the books of Alexander von Humboldt where he was inviting to discover the global South and so on. Uh, uh, and all these paintings that were quite violent but that people read them as something that is kind of uh, pure and mystic and sublime and beautiful and romantic, right? In the really violent erasures of all the civilizations that inhabited these spaces, right? And we wanted to subvert them, not by bringing the people in, right? In the obvious case, you know, in the John Gass painting where the indigenous people are getting pushed out by development and science and these white women with a school book, uh, but in the pre-militarization of these landscapes where we insert architect, militar, militarized architectures and make a series of exhibitions and installations where this legacy of the romantic painting as something sublimely innocent is questioned, right? Where all of a sudden we take the political agenda of the, of the architectures of, of a sort of a erasure and bring them back into the landscapes. Um, this part of a series of projects, including a play that we are currently working on uh, that should happen the first iteration uh, in a sort of remote play that is going to happen digitally and physically. A series of uh, collaborations with uh, with our fashion designer friends from United Nude, where we during COVID we reinvented what the collaboration meant, and we became the models of the lookbook and inserted ourselves in this poetry uh, sort of re recital, where we integrated some of the sounds of of the Puerto Rican uh, 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 tropics uh, into a sort of uh, animated play where the designers are not only behind the scenes, but we are actually taking the front place in the in these narratives of sort of post-colonial landscapes. Most recently, also we have a piece in the in the unfolding pavilion in Venice, where as part of our residency in a in a former building by John Hayduk that got demolished, uh, we got to make an installation on a post-colonial room. And I, I invited as the, the last iteration of the MoMA PS1, even knowingly that it was a, a too political of a project to submit to them. We wanted to propose to reread New York as a, as a place where most of a lot of uh, tropical uh, migrants from the world are forced to move in after imperialism arrives. Following the legacy of Inavis, we also uh, founded a collective called Post Navis with a lot of our former students and collaborators from different fields. And we wanted to carry on uh, an idea of what would, could be a planet, planetary uh, world making events. So that's some of the posters we did, uh, which was engaging with different events that took place in many different places, exhibitions that we hold in Nebraska, in Omaha, for example, where we reappropriated also the shapes uh, taught uh, in VTEPS, in the School of VTEPS, and to, to also um, engage with a more contemporary dialogue in what those shapes can, could also tell us today. We also did a series of publications and series of events, loud reading events where we could uh, loud read poetry or engage again with, around discussion about the legacy of Unavis. And that's like a, actually our, our last uh, physical lecture uh, slash installation that we did just before the start uh, uh, of, of COVID, uh, where we really reappropriated the stage and it became like a, a full installation. And it was more about a performance where we could also read, loud read poetry and, and also engage uh, with the public in many different ways. So that's some pictures of installation we did. And uh, since the arrival of uh, COVID in March, to the, especially to, to, to the, after it spread all over around the world and there was a global halt in the institutions, we decided to, that there was an opportunity to rethink the platforms of, uh, of social media and mass communication and, and use our networks of solidarity to extend uh, a, a pedagogical platform of architecture that we call Loud Readers based on the lectores of the tobacco factories. And as part of this platform, we had the opportunity to invade, invite many speakers from all around the world and run a trade school for free. Uh, started in March in 2020, and we're still running a program right now. Uh, this is some of the, if you go to the loudreaders.com, uh, you will be able to find. These are some of the speakers we had. It's, it's extending now, so we, we have many more coming. 
Uh, and now we're also doing a curatorial platform through the loud readers and, and publishing platform. Um, uh, discuss, uh, you know, critical theory like Kropotkin, real, uh, we have Tron Nobel from Belgium read, reading uh, Octavia Butler, the, the parable of the sower. So uh, right now we're curating this show and uh, uh, we have a series of loud reading events that all of you are welcome starting next week with Raquel Salas Rivera, Puerto Rican poet, then followed by Cordaya Tafa Henry, Liu Yujia and Pedro Neves Marquez uh, called the Planetary Wretch. So these are some of the upcoming loud reader events. Um, and we also turning this into our own teaching as we bring some of the programs of loud readers. And we are also running in collaboration with the College of Architecture and Urban Studies in uh, Virginia Tech, uh, Activism as Practice, where we bring people practicing activism as their creative practice. Uh, this platform has allowed us to, to be able to share without going through those uh, problematic uh, uh, social uh, media platforms where we can directly share the content that we're producing and our collaborators are producing. Um, and, and, and even go into another languages like Spanish, be able to loud read in the streets of Pittsburgh. So this also has been really fundamental that it's not only that happens on the comfort from home, but actually on the, on the, on the battleground, right? Where we are all gathering and trying to understand the, the, the white supremacist legacies of, of, of our cities and architectural roles and institutions role on this, uh, participating with many of these activists in on, and online discussions and, and so on and even uh, offering uh, pedagogical programs based on these principles. So that's on the studio we run when we were still at CMU at Carnegie Mellon, where we wanted to engage with the idea of loud readers, but in a contemporary way. So we ask each student to become a contemporary loud reader and to build a campus together that was like devoting to the, to the topic of loud reading. Uh, so that's like some pictures of a collective campus that they designed together. But for example, like uh, a lot of topics that we really saw uh, really took take a lot of place during last summer was already already very centered in the question that they were asking. So for example, Taylor built this institute about the question of emancipation of blackness through art, where she could displace a lot, a lot of topic around this and engage discussion again. Christoph Erwitt, uh, build a laboratory for rioting. Uh, again, like all around this idea of, of collective uh, gathering. Uh, Crystal Shu was uh, questioning the role of social media and the role of technology of surveillance with an institute uh, around media. Cassandra Howard was questioning land reparation and the how food and agriculture could become part uh, of a community. Si Shen was questioning the role of the American dream. So that's some of the collage. And we also had the opportunity to engage with a lot of different publics around the question of architecture and around the question of collectiveness. So that's like some workshops we did with the student, some small uh, students, so some small kids around the idea of constructing narratives together that would question uh, what can be the future. We also work on a series of books for children. So that's like the example of one of our first book that was called The Little Girl and the Sun. We're also working on three others uh, iteration of this story. One of the installation that we uh, really liked was called Palace of Megalith, where we could engage physically in, in the idea of constructing better worlds together. So we hold like a diff, diff, many different workshops with kids of many different ages, as you can see in the pictures, from very small to, to teenagers around the idea of what does it mean to build a city together? What does it mean to integrate, integra sorry, questions, uh, programs and collective programs that could make the city a better place for all? Part three. Form and Media, 2008. The limits of my language means the limit of my world. And, and now uh, we're gonna fly through the last part, the two last parts of the exhibition because it's more about how do we incorporate a lot of these principles that we're talking about as a, as a practice, right? Uh, and, and the first one I want to say is more like a declaration uh, or a manifesto that form was not invented by Europeans, right? So I, I feel like all this discussion about like formalism and, and so on, I find it sometimes very frivolous and opportunistic. And I love this image that, they, you know, a hieroglyph that was found in Nazca in Peru to show that, you know, even you can even say that even emojis were already being done all over the place, right? So it's not something that is really contemporary either. And that's really central to our practice as we engage with the legacy 
of solidarity and, and critical thinking through form making, really. Like if we look at the, we pile a flag in the, in the Andes to all the anarchist uh, publications done in the early 20th century, to many of the other works of the people that are really central part of our research and our sort of historical dialogue. Uh, it's really part of our practice, right? So publishing is really central to what we've done from DIY publications to like working with publishers and, and many other uh, iterations in between. Uh, 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 the curatorial practice this is our first self-commissioned exhibition back in 2011 in Beijing when we literally didn't even know if people were gonna come to the gallery because we just made an exhibition about all the things that we were working on in our apartment to more institutional exhibitions later on, our installation in the Chicago Architecture Biennale, uh, in 2015, in the first iteration, our recent book on the history of uh, on the contemporary role of narrative architecture, uh, published by NIE Publishers in the Netherlands. Uh, this was supposed to be our book last year, but we ended up publishing two more books later about uh, anti-racist architecture. So it's one of the books that we did last year. Uh, but it's a book that we've been working a long time, and it's really central to our practice and the possibility of a narrative architecture as a as a critical device uh, and a series of narrative collages and questioning the legacy of, 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 of utopian thinking in architecture. So the first one that we show in the Museum of Architecture, Art and Technology in Lisbon uh, back in 2017, uh, and the more recent one, our largest mural to date in the exhibition about Utopia uh, on the newest museum in Nuremberg in Germany. This opened during COVID, so it's uh, quite fascinating to think about ideal cities and utopias during COVID. Um, some pictures of the installation um, of the, again, you know, being able to be literally engaging with our, our contemporaries, but also with history in these spaces is also really central to us. Our, part, of, part of our research question, the legacy of form and ideology, this part of our research of the book, Pure Hardcore Icons, uh, where we question the legacy of ideology and form, right? And how it gets recycled sometimes where the ideologies completely change. Uh, the book that we designed too, and we published with Artifice Books in London, uh, got, it's, it's about to be translated, in, uh, it published in Chinese, it has been translated already and ex extended for a Chinese edition. Um, part of the exhibitions we did in, 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 in the occasion of the publication of the book. It was translated into German and published by Arch Plus in 2014. Uh, we did an exhibition also in Berlin in the Kunstwerke. Um, and we've been working also in how to apply this to pavilions and, and other projects. This is a poetry book we published in uh, 2015 based on that idea of a universal language. Uh, and we try to explore it through many different scales where form and form and, and, and text is used as, a, as form. And we're trying to sort of strip it from the, uh, from the content and trying to work with it in space. Some of the pictures of our apartment in Beijing and many of the installations we did and the fourth part. And the last part, part four, platform spaces for pedagogy. Since each, since each of us was several, we were already quite a crowd. And here, I'm just gonna show this project. It's a, the biggest competition we ever got into the finals. So it was like a big deal for us back in 2015. We were one of the five, 10 finalists to design the new National Center for Contemporary Art. So it was the largest museum in Russia. It was the first museum outside of the center of Russia. We went twice to Moscow for the project. Uh, and at the end, we didn't end up winning, but the, the ideas in this project were really central to our practice, um, where we proposed to put all the galleries in the second level, in the second volume, and free the ground level so people could interact with art and be part of the museum without having to pay a ticket. So it was almost how to steal the program back to the people. At the end, the client ended up choosing a tower because he wanted an icon. Then the project, project was crashed because it was over budget and so on. Uh, but the, the principle of the, the people having, having, to, having the opportunity to, to be with art and with the discourses without having to pay an entrance was really fundamental for us and became really central once we returned to Beijing heartbroken where we founded a gallery in the center of the city called Intelligentsia Gallery, where in a really small space, we run an alternative program that was anti-profit. Um, and it became really, really a hotbed of, of uh, critical positions in China. It was always group shows with international artists, including Chinese, of course, but from all around the world. And it didn't have any commercial 
point, it became really popular. A bunch of small galleries started opening in the Hutongs, and we got invited to collaborate also with many museums and institutions because of the popularity of, 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 of such a program, right? Nobody could understand why are these two people running an anti-profit space, right? When everything is so market-driven in, a, in, a, in the third largest art economy of the world, right? So we could bring African artists together with Chinese artists, with people working on internet art, working with uh, other stuff. And then we start developing in larger museums and institutions, some of those questions in a, in a larger format. So this allows us the opportunity to engage uh, in different ways with many of the people that are still collaborating with us today. So it, it was a real uh, ne a global network of solidarity through the work, right? From photographers working in Russia with the post-Soviet post architectures, to people working with the imperatives and the, and, the, and the ideologies behind language, right? With artists from all around the world, architects, designers. Um, uh, here is a, a work by Jason Mena based in Mexico City, working with underground economies and uh, Jubugong uh, with this tone that reads the dream is over in Mongolian. Um, here, Utopia Group showing one of the videos and many other artists, right? Uh, this is uh, one of the last exhibitions we did while living in New York, in, in Beijing, sorry. Uh, the one in the wall is Juan Chi, that is a really important filmmaker, Lin Ke. I know some of you know Fala Atelier from Lisbon. This is one of the pieces by them. Christopher Ray Perez, a poet based in Texas. Um, and then these two last projects, one of them is, a, we got invited to do a, 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 an art residency and a gallery in Beijing in a former Hutong. Uh, and we, we thought that the only way we could do such a program if, is if we provide services to the neighbors because the neighbors didn't have toilets and kitchen. So we proposed to the developer that the only way that this can be done is if we improve the conditions of everybody living there. So we did an exhibition to show how the space can be used and we proposed how to change the space, right? So we can create this courtyard where everybody has kitchen and, and toilets and we sort of uh, clean the place and so on and propose the spaces for the artist residency and so on. At the end, the, the developer didn't want to, to do it because he didn't want to spend money on the neighbor. So we had to decline the project, but it was also really important for another project that we're working on right now. So that's uh, the most recent project we developed. We were approached by the director of uh, international exchanges of the business department in Nebraska to create a new model for a school that would also be a boarding school. And it would be the idea was that it would it could take different different locations. So one of them would be Nebraska, but the other one would be Nigeria. And the idea was really to create an exchange between the students from both uh, spaces. What was really interesting for us is that the project was really questioning the idea of pedagogy, uh, because the idea was like to create a school that was centered around uh, two main cores that would be art and agriculture. So we developed the project. Uh, really thinking of a relationship with the land. So the idea was that to create a modular system that could extend or take many different forms depending of, on what site and what context the project would be built uh, and always have a relationship between each building and a, a courtyard or a land. Uh, so it was really interesting to think again, like uh, how agriculture and art can really engage uh, the idea of pedagogy and really enrich the dialogue uh, around that. So that's like some uh, images of uh, spaces that were meant to be really flexible and offer like, again, like many different ways uh, to teach and to learn and to exchange and to dialogue around those topics. And again, like the strong relationship with the art of spaces. And that's it. On time. <laughs> we on time. We did 43 minutes, so we went three over the planned time. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, I know it's always a little bit, um, you know, I missed a little bit the applause, you know. It, it's <laughs> yeah. not, not, not the, not the uh, reviewing applause, but just the collective being together and like yeah. really appreciative of, of the talk. Yeah. So thank you. Uh, this was great. Um, before I, uh, of course, I can, uh, I would love to have uh, a million questions with the two of you, but I would really love to include the students uh, and have a conversation start from, from their end. Um, so, uh, is, is there any questions in the, in the, in the audience?
no need to raise your hand. You can just uh, you can just, just jump into up. it. Yeah. There's a question by. Would you like to ask it, uh, Xing Wen Liung? Yeah. Can you? Yes. Great. Yeah. Hi. Uh, thank you for the lecture. Yeah, I've been following your um, project and website for a while. So, um, just kind of like I want to ask with the collage or cutout figures from the paintings or photographs or objects, or etc., that is shown in your project and installation as well. I'm wondering what's your take on narratives as a form of media or medium, um, especially kind of like situate itself in a world full of like distorted or alternative, altered narrative in the past few years, or perhaps has always been in history. Um, and also furthermore, how can it be become a tool for designers trying to bridge all those forms of narratives, such as oh. the poetry or fiction that's shown in your yeah. project? Yeah. Um, Digital and physical realm. These are these are great question. Let me let me do something quick. Uh, I'm gonna do a pull off here. <laughs> I'm gonna do a shameless plug. Uh, so our most recent book. I mean, the, no, it was not the most recent book. It was the, our most recent book, right? But uh, it's uh, called Narrative Architecture: A Clinical Manifesto, and I feel like in a playful way, what the book is doing or what we're trying to do in the book is to retell the story of 20th century modernist ideology and the critiques of it to explain what is the potential of critical narratives today in the way that when we look at Super Studio and like uh, actually Zoom and all that, there was so much latent potential there, but also it's so narrow their critique because it's still just a bunch of European boys producing these critiques, right? So what happens when we untap in these narratives, right? When we, when the voices that are generating these discourses are not just a few privileged people working within some institutions, but rather the historically oppressed, right? Uh, uh, I don't know, trans feminist discourses, right? Uh, sort of queer, black, indigenous, uh, 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 Southeast Asian, you know, I don't know, like there's so many, many forms of thinking about the world that are missing from these narratives, right? And, and that's why sometimes, even if we think about uh, what's critical, right? And, and for us, critical is very specific in relationship to critical theory, right? Critical can only exist in as much as it's searching for human emancipation. So you can have things that look critical, but they're not, right? They're not operating as critical. So can we have critical narratives you know, and that can happen also not only by being really serious, but, but uh, about being subversive and using irony and humor, right? And borrowing and reclaiming and reappropriating and questioning authorship and questioning the idea of the single genius, right? Uh, uh, and, and all these sort of uh, uh, narrative, historical narratives that had been kind of forced upon us by the institutions. Uh, I feel like there's so much potential on tap. I feel like there's as many possibilities as there are people out there, right? Uh, and if we understand the role, the really critical role that narrative can play in subverting those uh, positions of power, we may be able to do something, right? Uh, I feel like that's really fundamental and it's really central to our practice, to, like not only to the practice, but also to like practice teaching, you know, how we relate to each other and so on. And also, I think to, to build on, on the question of narrative and especially collage, uh, with, with, again, like this, thinking of it as a, a possible critical tool, what really interests us is that we see it really as a bridge between history, present, and future. So the historical part is really important. So, and that goes when we speak about collage. So that's why, like, for example, in, a work, in our work, when we do collages, um, all the paintings, because you mentioned paintings, all the references that are there, are very specific and they are used in a way that is meant to, to be a critic, to offer critic to. Uh, because again, as Cruz mentioned, is I think uh, we still no, need to rework a lot our relation, relationship sorry, with history and what type of history and what type of references are we using again and again. And we know that uh, a, a lot, so it's not, not, not just about knowing what type of history and knowledge 
to pull out to offer like a more critical point of view, but also try to contextualize them more. So that's why the, the tool of narrative is interesting. So when we when we deal with narrative architecture, we use uh, historical uh, material and we try to offer a kind of different take on it. So that's where the narrative is added and that's where the bridge to the present and to the future is important too. And the bridge to the future, future is also like, when we think of thinkers like France Fanon who really wrote about it, it's the importance of using imagination and construction of imaginaries as a tool to reclaim a future where you belong. Because when we think, so again, when we go back to our relationship to history, which is linked to the present, right? It's always kind of a, it's very curated as we know, right? We always say that history, history is subjective. It depends on who's telling the story and who has the, the power to bring this knowledge up front. So if history is subjective, and we know the present is the same, right? Because we, we are all uh, really uh, controlled in a way with many different ideologies that are, that are around us. It means that the possibility of future is controlled too. And what we want is really rethink at what tools can we use to offer an alternative and to, to try to kind of empower different voices for the right to have a future. Thank you so much. Yeah, I have a maybe less of a question, but I was I'm kind of like asking for tips. So maybe a little background. I'm I'm on my thesis uh, year, and first of all, really thank you for what you two have been doing. I've followed your work, and also you were mentioning about like networks pedagogy, pedag networks of pedagogical kind of like voices that have been like really really loud lately for sad reasons but really really helpful for people like me who are like interested in post-colonialism questions and critical theory but so for me what i'm like uh focusing right now is looking into documentations of vernacular indonesian architecture that's where i'm from and how it relates to the ethnographic studies of the dutch colonials and how it was the tools of kind of like uh, dissecting like indigenous societies and how it relates to the documentations of architecture and so I'm like looking at that and how that legacy actually was continued by uh, in independent Indonesia like they were pretty much just doing the same thing without criticizing it but then uh, other than like uh, cr criticizing that history I'm always in a little bit of like uh, weird position or kind of like weary position not to kind of like repeat the mistakes of the past or so as as in like questions of where if I'm like making design interventions aren't I just kind of teetering on that like little line of am I like romanticizing the traditional am I like exploit quote unquote exploiting the indigenous studies and then if I'm like creating like a new quote unquote city am I aren't I just kind of like taking the space of like indigenous land. So it's like a lot of like <laughs> teetering on the, and it doesn't help that I have like six, uh, several months to left to do this thesis, <laughs> you know? I just like, I just want tips like yeah. uh, about how to navigate. I think it's a really, I think it's a really fundament, uh, fundamental question that we all should be asking ourselves. Doesn't matter where we are in, uh, particularly former colonies. I mean, I, I don't know what does it mean to be in a former colony because I come from a, something that is still a colony in a way. <laughs> but, but I think like what is really interesting is, I would say two things, you know, and it has to do with the narrative thing. One mm -hmm. is to not be so serious is fundamental, right? Right, I, I feel like, especially when you are trying to be subversive, that's the first thing. And then the other one is to understand the relationships, relationships of power, including yours, right? By not being so serious, you'll be able, to, you also will be able to criticize yourself. I think that that's the most fundamental part to have a critical argument that is gonna move us forward. And I don't know what's the, what's the character of the project and I don't know because I haven't seen it and all that, but my biggest recommendation, and that's how we try to approach everything we're trying to do, even if we're really serious about what we mean, is that there needs to be a space for you to be able to, to critically reflect on what you're doing. Understand the limitations, you know, being honest about that, 
being honest about your condition, right? Uh, being from there, but also not uh, like, you know, having a different relationship to indigeneity, all that is fundamental, right? Uh, I feel like I will add one third one is always seek the critical voices out, right? That, that's, that's all I can offer, right? So that critical knowledge is fundamental. You know, we started the lecture talking about that discussion between France and the US that is quite ridiculous. It's because they're overlooking the, the actual speakers of this, you know, the people that have been engaging with the people that put their life on the line, you know, generating critical discourses of the, col the coloniality, anti-colonialism and so on, you know, like there's indigenous communities and black and brown and white people dying for this, right? So the work is there. So when they assume that the positions are coming from them, that's a complete uh, act of arrogance, right? So I will I will seek out the the your who are your your net, networks of historical solidarity, right? Not only the ones that are alive, but the ones that have lived, and then not take yourself so seriously and and employ you know the the capacity of also being critical in every single direction, including yours, right? So I feel like that that then whatever you're gonna produce may be also useful for other people later on, right? Because it, it, it develops that character of subversivity. Yeah, I agree. It's like, it, well, it's like taking really seriously what the subject, but not yourself. I think it's like this, <laughs> because then it allows, as Cruz mentioned, like this uh, layer of self-criticism, which is very important. And as you mentioned, especially when you deal with those topics, because it's, it's, it's quite delicate, as you were saying, the line in between, you know, uh, what is your position within this subject and what, what can you really offer? But I think, you know, as you were describing it, just the, and Cruz mentioned the name to be honest, but I think it's very important to, in the way of how you really frame your thesis and you kind of, you accept the limitation that you have doing the thesis too. And if there's a way that this comes within the thesis, as Cruz mentioned, reaching out also to people who have uh, the knowledge in a way that they are closer uh, in person, right, to, 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 to this subject, that could be too, and allowing people to join the platform that you create where, where you, you feel that it's not your place anymore. Maybe that's when you can bring somebody else that is kind of- the Networks you know, of more, solidarity. Right, more knowledgeable on this. And then how, how can you always like kind of foster thesis that uh, kind of creates a place for dialogue. So yeah, I always think that a thesis is like a, it's like a mini practice, right? You want to generate a, 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 pra a practice, a, for, a, a model of a practice. So it's not something that you just abandon once you leave school, but actually something that teaches you how to operate uh, as, a, as a designer, as a thinker, as a human being. Thank you very much. That was very helpful. Anyone else? It's a great question. From the Florence Studio students, uh, feel free to also refer to some of the readings that uh, Cruz and Natalie shared with us beforehand uh, uh, to, to, to maybe expand on the, what we've done, what we're doing with Studio or um, just your take on, on the presentation and the readings. Um, yeah, I, I have a question. Um, so I, I'm really interested in kind of the way that you said the only purely democratic architecture is um, the architecture that dismantles uh, or reappropriates or warps the uh, products that are derivative of the systems of oppression. Um, so like the taking down of the statues was uh, the example that you gave. And that kind of reminded me of the, um, um, the poor images article that you sent to. Yeah. Um, could you talk a little more about that? Um, is the only way to kind of create that purely democratic architecture to, uh, to destroy? I, um, I don't want to call it destroy because it's yeah, not quite productive. No, I love destroying. I, love, I think destroying is a very appropriate word and it's very necessary, right? Because uh, if, you have a, if you have a structure that is killing you, you have to destroy it. There's no way mm -hmm. around it, right? So I feel like that's how why supremacy works. That's how heteropatriarchy works. That's how capitalism works. It's just there to kill you because uh, you are not important. You're not valuable. You're not human, right? So there's many layers to this. So 
I would say, I don't think it's the only one the, the statue is coming down, but it's a, it's a truly democratic form, right? Uh, all those racist monuments, they were never democratically erected. That's, that's you know, like, and, and by democracy, I don't mean voting, right? Like that's just maybe a form of a, a representative democracy in some places. I mean, democracy by really considering people, right? By considering uh, the people have been marginalized historically, right? Like all these, these monuments, they were erected as, as not only as an act of aggression, right? To symbolize and perpetuate a history of, of apartheid, segregation, and so on. But they are funded, maintained, and protected by the same apparatus. That's why, you know, people die in New Mexico trying to dismantle one of the statues because a white supremacist came and shot them. You know, the police is not going to help you bring them down, right? Uh, that you may go to prison for actually graffiti in them. You know, it, it is there is still a full apparatus in place to protect those racist monuments, right? In many of our institutions, because the statues are the, the very obvious ones, but many of our institutions have names of racists funded by colonial money. You know, blood. You know, it is like that. It is still like that. So, what can we do, right? How can we as people? take into consideration all, all those that have been historically oppressed and dismantle those systems. It's fundamental that we think about that, right? I feel like uh, the arguments of Black Lives Matter are pretty similar to the arguments of, 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 of a lot of the indigenous uh, discourses on ecology, right? Where you, the settler colonial state is killing you and you had to dismantle it, right? Because it's destroying the environment, it's making us sick, it's uh, uh, spreading pandemics, it's destroying, Earth, but also is impris imprisoning you, is punishing you, is policing you. You know, so there's a full apparatus that manifests in many different ways that we had to be aware that we had to come together to bring it down because we are all affected by it, right? And and what what we mean by the postcolonial in our argument that is more about narrative and the sort of future and so on is that it's not anymore the people in the colonies that are dying, right? So we don't have the excuse to decide if we care because we're affected by it. COVID is the perfect example, but also the, the, the decay of the environment. We all, if, the, if the earth dies, we all die. Like we are in this ball of dirt together. I mean, I know that Elon Musk wants to go to Mars that I wish he already went and stayed there, but he hasn't yet. Like we, we cannot leave earth, right? So. It's not anymore something of the colonies, but what happens when everything, all this sort of, uh, you know, Achille Bembe in his book, Brutalism, he talks about this era of extraction where, where the, there's the spill of organic matter, right? Kill us all and contaminates us all. That's our current situation, right? So how do we understand that we have to come together, at least the most of subaltern humanity, right? Where we have been told historically that we don't own the earth, right? Because uh, some people truly feel like they own it so they can excavate, they can push you away and whatever. What happens, what happens when we say no, you know, let's dismantle this sense of uh, ownership over the earth and let's see what happens after that is done, right? So how can we, we be truly democratic in a planetary sense, right? Through solidarity, to taking care of each other, through being custodians of the living and non-living. It's fundamental in this. Um, so we need those imaginations to work for us. I was just going to say, but you said it already. Like we yeah, I, I quoted <laughs> the thing that Natalie was going to quote. So I just uh, stole the quote from Wait, Natalie. No, it's good, it's good. I should, uh, I should remember that we like, like to, uh, to quote a lot, but especially because of his uh, re relevancy, especially nowadays in what he writes, because yeah. he really managed to, 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 to really draw um, the line of a network between all the problems of that we have right right now so social crisis ecological crisis human non-human in a way that we really understand yeah. how it all comes together and how we had we have to address it as yeah. such and when he questions you know who owns the planet who owns the earth i think it's really uh, something very striking that we can think about a lot and going back to the to the idea of dismantling for example those those uh, statues they were supposed to be in public spaces. And I think also it goes back to what happened this summer where, you know, who owns the earth, but also who owns those spaces, who can, who can be in those who spaces? Who is the public, who, right? 
where can you be collectively? And we saw so much, you know, violence is coming from just being together in a so-called public, public space. space. Yeah. Yeah. And or when you think of those statues that are take the center part of a, again so-called public space where they carry all these ideologies and they, you know, it's it's very it's an icon, right? That the statue yeah. is. <laughs> It's but, not just carrying the ideology; it's like really making a stand. But that, that's 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 only the obvious one. But you can look at the at the, you know, the pipeline in the Lakota territory, right? The, the Lakota Access Pipeline. You, those are monuments too to a settler colonial state, right? To to fuel some certain forms of economy that are gonna kill us, right? So we can look at the. I feel like the statues are the pimples, but there's a full condition underlying, right, uh, under everything else, right? And we need to be able to see them all as part of the same apparatus, right? And actually, Ben talks about that, but also Silvia Rivera Cusicanqui talks about that, and every single probably anti-colonial philosopher all around the world is gonna pretty much tell you the same things, right? So we need to somehow find all that sort of collective intelligence and, and get together and, and work towards the dismantling of those structures. So destruction is great in that sense. <laughs> this was really a great and conversation. And I know it's always hard to break the Zoom barrier for uh, participation, but I really appreciate all the students' effort to, uh, to jump in and, and, and share. Um, uh, maybe I can, I can take one last question, like I said in the beginning, to, to be respectful. Otherwise, I can also tons of questions. Any other students? Okay, then I'll, 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 <laughs> I'll go for it. Uh, really, again, from, from, from all of us, this was uh, quite a fantastic uh, presentation that gave us so much uh, to think about uh, from uh, architectural pedagogies to uh, the idea of the common to the idea of language and uh, the construction of genealogies and and, and I think uh, not to not to go sort of in one specific uh, project or venue of, of your practice but uh, to me it's sort of really striking when when you present the, the work to to hear um, uh, sort of this embedded uh, continuous tension that exists between this need for uh, sort of constructing uh, an individual stance uh, or reinforcing and, and maybe empowering specific individual perspectives, the multiplication of narratives and the kind of uh, uh, the, the move away from the singular heteronormative male white uh, sort of uh, genius. Um, uh, Together with sort of uh, sort of holding this thought at the same time as sort of this uh, maybe one of the words that has been sort of shared the most throughout the presentation is this network of solidarity like uh, shared system of solidarity which is in some sense transcends the idea of that individual narrative right the idea of of uh, the necessity of building a shared genealogy where references are matter which references are constructing a shared ideology or a shared space of, of, of gathering. And so uh, I am really um, fascinated and, and impressed by the fact that, first of all, you like you suggested also to, to Indra earlier on to the students asking about thesis that there, there is not a single fix to this, but rather an ambition to be okay with the collision of those two worlds uh, quite literally uh the individual sphere and the and and the collective uh knowledge but i, I would like to to know from you like if this is something that resonates or, or if it's the, the the collision between these two elements is something that uh, you see as a problem or, or or how do you reconcile those two in in the presentation of projects in the construction of pedagogies etc yeah i think this is this is a great question and maybe I'll combine it also, Alexander, I don't know if he wants to ask the question, but I think it, it kind of relates to some other thing. Um, um, this sort of balancing act between 
I wouldn't say giving a voice because that would be very pat paternalistic and patronizing. I, I hate when people say, ah, let's, let's share the space. No, it's like, get the fuck out of the way. Like, that's how I would say it. Like, you just let the people be, you know, they don't need you to authorize them. You, they just need you to stop blocking them from doing their job, like doing their work and, and, and enjoying life and so on. So I will say um, we are very conscious of a lot of the tensions between the subject matter like our research, you know, the things that we were looking at, you know, uh, with time, you know, we have figured out that a lot of the people that we've been looking at for a long time, they were anarchists, all of them, you know, right? I think I'm more in the centralized power these days, but I feel like there's a lot of a sort of philosophical anarchism in the work, you know, Malievich, Beran Molayeva, all these people, Unovis, the loud readers in Puerto Rico, uh, a lot of the indigenous collectives, you know, in the Americas, they are, you know, what some people would call anarchists, even if they wouldn't use the terminology themselves because of the, the way they structure themselves, sort of uh, radical forms of democratic participation, right, mm. through anarchy as a philosoph again, as a philosophical and political movement. Uh, and this may be, in a way, against the idea of how we understand the production of art and architecture, where you always need some sort of author there and some sort of genealogy that kind of legitimizes institutions and people. And that tension is in a way is interesting because it allows us to question even our own research and our own practice, right? Where I would say like, if we're really effective in what we do, we will render ourselves useless and unimportant. And that's, that's, that's what I tell to a lot of people. Like we, we spent last semester in a seminar that we teach in Illinois called From Black Square to Black Reason, you know, basically from Malevich to Achilbenbe, uh, where we spend many, many weeks discussing the role of laziness as a subversive tool against neoliberalism, capitalism, and so on, right? When you're useless, you cannot be exploited, right? And I feel like the, our positioning as a, as, a, as a tool for liberation, right? in this struggle against uh, capitalism will render us useless. So the fact that we had to go around lecturing and saying like, we need to do this is we're still not there yet, right? Like we still are serving a purpose, right? So we still can be exploited. We still can exploit. There's still this sort of, we're still playing with the institutions. So we haven't won the fight in a way. And we are aware of this and we are constantly struggling. How can we truly be lazy, but also how we can foment this networks of laziness around us that are not lazy in the in the pro, in the productive way but lazy in the in the sort of against the institution of capitalism productivism whatever whatever way right so i feel like somehow the question you're asking is addressing this issue for us that is the tension between the, the historical narrative of the all these voices coming in, being able to participate, being able to tell you what has been missing from the story and from history and from the ways we produce and you know controlling the means of production to use a Marxist term, right? Uh, but at the end, the goal is that we don't need to do this anymore, right? Therefore, we 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 are we are completely unnecessary, all of us, right? So and everybody can be happy and live life and be free, right? Uh, and I feel like that that's where the real tension lies where we want to work really hard to dismantle something and we do it through the work through the authorship through finding uh, all these uh, applying you know tools of representation and presentation so all these voices can be heard and subverting the historical narratives that have constructed power around us that's the process but that's not the goal Field. The goal is emancipation, right? <laughs> For the living and non-living, right? So there's a lot of work to be done to be able to be lazy in a way, I would say, right? And, and, and then if I want to like just tweak, tweak in the, 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 you know, the danger of negation of the individual in ideology, which I feel it relates to this question, right? Uh, uh, the, the burden of, uh, sorry, the one before, sorry, where he says that the fight with passion and being misinterpreted as an aggression and all that, these days, I actually don't care if people are like afraid of me being too violent when I speak about oppression, right? And, and I've been accused of putting race above everything and putting transgender above everything or whatever, right? Yeah, 
that's what it should be all along, right? Because those, those are the things that are keeping us where we are. So if we should all be obsessed with these things, right? It doesn't matter if your work deals with technology, if your work deals with form, if your work deals with pedagogy, if we can truly care about the future, we have to engage with these things directly, indirectly, support who does it, you know, like talk with it, discuss it, deconstruct our practices based on that. Because otherwise, what else do we have left, right? And I feel like we need to be aggressive. And we need to be there in your face and we cannot take the foot out of the gas and we can have to keep on calling for demands and we have to keep on saying like, uh, to quote, uh, we quote a lot of uh, Sloterdijk, even if he's a kind of a conservative philosopher, he wrote this book called, You Must Change Your Life. We have to change our lives. Whatever we've been doing is not working, right? So how can we truly do that? Like, what are we willing to compromise and lose? right? In order to make that happen. It's something that we have to ask ourselves every day, right? And I feel like somehow they're related these questions, right? Uh, on, one sand, on one hand, uh, the idea of artistry and, 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 and subversiveness and, and irony, right? That is kind of, it's always subjective and it, it always comes from a position of individuality, not an individuality, I would say, from the individual, right? Like from the in individual subjectivity, from your experiences, your, your, your place in the world, your relationship to others, right? That is also subjective, but also from the goals and the ideas, right? So again, you know, against the discourses of people like Patrick Schumacher or like, uh, you know, uh, the, the book of non-referential architecture and so on that say there are or, or like Francis Fukuyama when he said that the history is dead blah 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 neoliberal democracy won the narrative the great narratives are over no they're not right like we have great narratives and and the you know Black Lives Matter the fight for the ecology transgender trans, transgender fights uh, uh, fights for for the non-human uh, you know indigenous communities those are the great narratives right. Uh, and, and we somehow have to acknowledge them as such and work with whatever we can and whatever is comfortable to us, either more aggressive or less aggressive to make them happen, right? Because we are running out of time, I would say. Yeah, just to add on on that, but it's also the idea of challenging and deconstructing because we used to were deconstructing before too, uh, this, because again, it's like this, this kind of cult of the individual was set since you know the beginning of colonialism of a, with the enlightenment with the enlightenment in Europe and the idea of a, of an individual right first yeah the I think therefore mm -hmm. I am right it's never we are it's always like I am you know I think I am as a, as an individual but it it also carried a lot in the way we live even if in the way we live as a society and I think uh, just to add up on this point like the the need to rethink of different system of being together because I think that's what really is endangered. And when we see, you know, the, again, like the latest crisis, uh, social crisis, or climate crisis, or health crisis that we are right now, it really uh, illustrates that point too. So we, everything that is happening right now, it's it's a, is a global uh, it's a global problem. And how to to come to come back to this kind of planetary awareness especially when we think of our future because it, it's urgent right and the fact that if we keep trying to address and it goes the same with you know, with the problem that we have right now when we try to address systematic issues in a kind of individual um it it, it tends to derail a lot of the conversation so also it's the power of of acknowledging that to address systematic problems of course, it has to come from our individuality, sorry, but also it has to come from acknowledging that we belong to a collective yeah. and that the strength of a collective yeah. is really important in kind of reframing yeah. and again, rethinking of, of, of tomorrow, right? Because I think it's like something that is very urgent. And again, when we think of a lot of, of discourses that have been, um, you know, pushed until now and the same goes I'm trying to linking everything because it's difficult to separate, but the same goes with our relationship to the land and all of the you know, private projects that have been taking place or this kind of idea when we pre presented also some project that you know the, the individual can kind of solve everything. 
also when we think of the architecture, master planet. right, master planet, or when we think also of the role of architects, right, and it goes back to the discussion about pedagogy and architecture. Again, the pedagogy of architecture is a lot uh, construct, constructed around this idea of the individual uh, being able to design a solution, yeah. and we we know, you know, we have to know that that this has a lot of limitations. So again, it's like always like a call to 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 coming together and to acknowledge that we we belong also yeah. to, to a, a much wider structure. And, and I think like to link the last question that was added there, because uh, uh, Eli uh, asked about, I mean, I don't know if you would like to ask it in, in person, if you would like add, to add something else to what is written there, because I can read it too. Um, I actually have to be going like right now to another class, <laughs> which is really horrible timing. Um, but um, I appreciate your the discussion and it was really, really enlightening and your work is really, really wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that, was, that was funny because I think it's a really great question. <laughs> the, the role of the negation of the individuality of individual in ideology, which is, I wouldn't say there is so much about the, the negation of the individual, uh, I don't think that's the, 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 the question that is problematic. The question is when somebody is not recognized as a person. Negation of the other. The negation of the other, the negation of the person, mm -hmm. right? The, the sort of invisibilization and the rendering of, 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 you know, as you don't exist. So I don't think it's so much about individuality, but rather about uh, humanhood, you know, the, the, the being, being alive and being important and, and matter, ma you know, the Black Lives Matter addresses that, right? Like, a black light matter, but also um, it also addresses that when black lives matter, everybody else lives better, right? And I feel it goes to that role. Like, so if you can think of the other or the people as 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 people, right? I wouldn't say individuals, but rather as humans, as alive, that completely changes everything. So even if you don't care about them, you still have to consider them. Right? And, and this maybe switches into the idea of care that is so popular these days. We kind of forced to care. I don't think it's so much about caring, but about actually acknowledging that people have a right to a dignified life and so on. So I, I will say that for us, that's a, you know, I'm, I'm more into the, into the idea of the commons and, and stuff like that, but, uh, but people are really important, right? In, the, in that discourse and, and, and being part of a community and being there and acknowledge that you matter and you're important is also fundamental in all of this. Um, yeah, maybe that wraps up all the questions, maybe. <laughs> Even the ones that left. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, really, thank you so much again for this wonderful evening slash afternoon for, uh, with you. Um, uh, it was a pleasure um, and uh, I'm sure um, the, the, the ending on how do we come together uh, to reimagine uh, spaces of living and spaces of caring uh, as a community is going to resonate with many of, of our uh, uh, students and colleagues and, and, and teachers and instructors <laughs> in, the, in the audience. So, so thank you again. Um, and uh, I hope we'll get a chance to, to meet and, uh, and, and, and chat in person very soon. Yes, thanks a lot to everybody for the questions and for, for staying and, you know, always feel free to reach out to us. We're always happy to, to you know, to discuss and to, and to hear what's happening and everything. So thanks a lot for the invitation. Yeah, thank you very much. Was, yeah, we really Had a great enjoyed time. the discussion. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks thank you. Um, and for, for, for our um, um, Florence uh, team, we're going to split now into two groups with Luca and myself, and we'll see you Bye. maybe. Bye. Ciao, Cruz. Ciao, Natalie. Ciao. Um, and ciao, everybody. It was lovely to see so many uh, Syracuse students. I also saw some uh, backdrop in Slocum, which was super <laughs> weird. <laughs> but, it's it's uh, virtual backgrounds. <laughs> um, so, so really, really exciting conversation. I, I, I hope uh, all of you saw uh, the way that it sort of needs itself within the prompt of the studio. Maybe it's not uh, super directly, you know, 
uh, in the center of it, but it's within the logic of how do we negotiate this local and global histories and uh, how do we live together in the space of, of the house. So anyway, without uh, making this any longer, Luca, I would say, unless you, you have some, some extra comments, I would say let's take, I mean, for my group at least, we take a uh, 15 minutes uh, break. Yeah, 15 uh, minutes sounds good. And we'll meet in our individual uh, rooms. Great. My bad. Very nice seeing all of you. Thank you for doing the readings and the questions. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll keep doing this. It's going to be great. Ciao. See you. All right. Take care, there. everybody. Bye.